Uh, hi, I'm Colin Kerspel. I will be talking about um, profiling a FreeBSD kernel boot. Uh, Sometimes you'll hear from Hammer trying to start in it. Uh, when I started writing this, I thought that the subtitle was going to be from MI Startup to start in it. Uh, I realized after doing this work that in fact there's stuff in Hammer Time that I care about as well. Um, so, why profile FreeBSD kernel boot? Um, so when I started writing my slides on the, the flight over from Vancouver, uh, this is where I thought I should start. But then after a couple minutes of sort of staring at the title, I realized this is the wrong place to start. Where I should start is, why did I profile a previous secret boot? So the reason I got started is uh, last year I bought a new laptop. Uh, it is unfortunately not this one I'm using right now because my laptop does not have a VGA output. But uh, thank you, Michael, for loaning me a laptop so I can use it. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, good. Uh, yes, I didn't screw that in, but uh, good. Um, so, unlike many Fugitive developers who use things like Mac OS, um, I insist on running Fugitive on my laptops. Uh, unfortunately, we have traditionally had some issues with video drivers on uh, laptops, particularly with recent Intel hardware. Um, so for several months, I was going through this cycle of uh, loading the kernel module, noting that it panicked, rebooting, changing some code, recompiling, and going back to the beginning and getting another kernel panic. Um, I went through this hundreds and hundreds of times. And as the system was rebooting, I would start to notice things. Um, sometime around reboot number 100, uh, I noticed the text would be scrolling by as, as the system was booting up, and sometimes it would stop for a while. And I was wondering, well, so what, what's FreeBSD doing in the, the second that's paused there? So I figured, well, I, I, OK, I'll, I'll start making into kernel code. Um, you know, sometimes you can sort of guess what's happening, because it, you, you, you see a message printed just after it, it stops pausing, and that's all we related to what it was doing. So. You can go in and, and sprinkle some printouts in there, saying uh, that the R R R T R R RDTSC is, is the, the Intel CPU cycle count function. So this was just printing a number um, wherever I put the printf, uh, w which told me how many CPU cycles it had gone through. I, I knew I had uh, 2.7 billion CPU cycles per second. So I could look at those numbers and see oh, when the number jumps a lot, that's, that's where it's spending the time. Uh, so this was enough for me to get started in, in, in figuring out uh, where the time was going. So the VM page array was taking about 20 milliseconds per gigabyte of RAM. Uh, my new laptop has 32 gigs of RAM, so this was about two thirds of a second. Um, of course, this would never used to be an issue because we didn't have so much RAM. Uh, booting uh, an EC2 instance that has two terabytes of RAM, uh, it takes quite a bit longer. Um, there was a, a one second pause um, very close to the beginning of the, of the, the system boot where it's calibrating the CPU clock frequency. We, we have the um, basic uh, PC timer that takes at uh, 1.1 something megahertz. And we were literally pausing for one second, waiting for that timer to kick over and over again, uh, and, and measuring the difference in the, the CPU cycle counts. Um, Later on, we do the same thing for calibrating the APIC timer. Uh, we spent two seconds of, of initializing the, the mouse driver. Um, so I, it was easy for me to, to notice some things where time was being spent. Uh, but I, I, going through this, I realized I, I really need to have a more systematic way of, of uh, figuring things out, rather than just you know, looking at it, seeing, oh, it seems to be pausing a while at this point. Let's see if we can dig into that. So the FreeBSD boot process, um, you start off some sort of BIOS or EFI running on the, the hardware. This is the, the code that comes with the, the device itself. That gets us to a, a bootloader, sometimes several bootloaders. Um, one of them eventually loads the FreeBSD kernel. Within the kernel, there's machine-dependent initialization. <coughs> so on, on AMD64, this is the, the hammer time function. Um, then we go to machine independent startup routines, which is the MI startup function. 
Um, and then eventually we need to start in it so that we can move into user land. Um, that includes the, the process of mounting the file system because you can't launch in it until you have a file system to launch in it from. Uh, once you're in user land, uh, you go through all the, the RCD scripts, um, which launch your demons and so on. So what I'm looking at for this talk is just the, the kernel initialization. Um, I know that some other people have been looking at speeding up the user land initialization. Um, about 10 years ago, actually, I did some work on launching RCD scripts in parallel and decided it really wasn't worth it because almost all the time was being taken <coughs> initialization on the hardware I had at that point. Um, but once we manage to get kernel <coughs> initialization faster, hopefully somebody will uh, pick up the baton and speed up user land initialization. And I'm also hoping that somebody who cares about intricate details of bootloaders will be working on speeding up the bootloader because that also takes a few seconds longer than I would like. But uh, I, I don't really want to get anywhere near the bootload right now. So I, I'm hoping somebody else will do that. So first thing I, I thought when I decided to look into this was, well, let's, let's look at what Linux does. So Linux, uh, while it's booting, it, it prints a timestamp at the start of every line of kernel output. So I just grabbed five lines of, of a Linux kernel booting here. And you can see um, about 74 milliseconds happened between the eighth, third and fourth lines. So uh, maybe it was time spent probing the, the mouse driver, I don't know. Uh, and then another 14, uh, sorry, 140 milliseconds spent between there and the last line there. Um, it, it gave us some sense of, of where we're at in the boot process uh, in, in terms of time, but it's, it's only time stamping uh, the points where the kernel decides to print things. Um, the Linux kernel is more verbose than FreeBSD when it boots up. So to some extent, it, it helps them more because they already have lots and lots of lines being printed. Um, but it, it's still not all that useful. Um, you're, you're, you're limited to getting time stamps at certain points. Of course, you can always go into Linux and add more print apps because then they're all going to get timestamped. Um, but it, it's not fantastic from, from that perspective. Uh, um, a worse problem is uh, at the beginning of the Linux kernel boot, you get a whole bunch of zeros. Uh, and this happens because the, the time it's using is based on the CPU cycle count, the same uh, RDTSC I, I mentioned earlier. Um, but at the beginning of the system boot, it doesn't know how, how fast that clock is running. So, it just prints zeros until it gets to the point in the boot process where it knows how fast the clock is. Then it can start dividing by the appropriate number and then printing that out. So beginning of the, of the, the Linux boot, uh, you actually have no way of knowing how long it took um, until it got up to that point of, of uh, knowing how fast the clock is going and then it starts printing out a sensible number. So, in FreeBSD, of course, anytime you want to profile anything, we look at dtrace. Um, unfortunately, uh, while dtrace is a, a wonderful tool for profiling the system, um, it is a rather heavyweight tool. Um, it uses things like uh, page drop drafts and memory allocation and thread scheduling. I'm sure there's other things it uses as well. Uh, I, once I realized it needed all of those, I decided I, uh, it's not very really useful for me because at the time we start running the kernel, we don't have anything. We, we have one CPU which is running some code. Interrupts are turned off. We haven't got virtual memory set up yet. Um, we certainly don't have any threads. Um, so there's no way that each phase can work in that sort of environment. Later on in the boot process, we could use each phase to, to capture the, the later parts of, of the, the kernel initialization. But I wanted something that could handle the entire kernel initialization process. So dtrace wasn't really going to be it. KTR is a, a lesser known system in FreeBSD. Um, it's been around since, I think, FreeBSD 4? <laughs> a long time, anyway. Um, and so it's a general mechanism for logging kernel events. Um, you call a function, and you give it a bunch of parameters, and it just takes them and stuffs them into a buffer. And then later on, you can just read out the contents of that buffer. Um, 
It's pretty much what I wanted, except it's not designed for profiling the, the boot process. Um, it uses a circular buffer, which is it's great if, as most PBSD developers are doing, they're, uh, with, with KTR, they, they have the question, why did my system just crash? So a circular buffer will have the most recent things that happened just before the crash, and that's great for you, uh, using KTR. Uh, but for profiling the, the kernel boot, what you want to do is get the beginning of the kernel boot, uh, or the, the, the beginning of the system running, rather, uh, which will include the kernel boot process. And then if the system keeps on running after that for a while, you don't want to have all that data erased by things that happen later on, because you only care about that, that very beginning of the, of the system running. Um, the, the buffer size in KTR defaults to 1024. Uh, it, it's configurable as a, 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 a compile time option, but it, we need a lot more, more than that. It's another thing that would, would need to, to be changed. Um, it can run almost at the beginning of the boot process, uh, not quite. Um, it, it uses cur thread, uh, which is a, a pointer to the, the current thread running on a CPU. Um, when we first start running, uh, that doesn't exist because that, that data comes from per CPU um, records, which haven't been initialized <coughs> yet until we get to the end of the, the machine dependent startup. So all of these things, I, I could have made KTR do what I needed, but uh, in the end, it was just a case of, well, what I need is, is so simple, I might as well just write it myself rather than coercing KTR to uh, work for with my needs. So I, I wrote my own system, which is uh, called TSLog, timestamp log. Um, two very small files in the source tree implement this. Um, the, the header file provides a bunch of macros, which uh, make it a, a more usable interface to it. And then the, the C file, just uh, it, it, it has one function which is exposed for locking the records, and then another uh, assist tool which is used for, for dumping the data out. Um, so uh, defaults to 256,000 records. Um, booting my laptop, I, I ran, up, ran up to about 90,000 records. So uh, in, in the, the immortal words that may or may not have been spoken by Bill Gates, this should be enough for everybody. <laughs> um, so the, the way it works, um, when the, the function gets called to, to log a record, um, there's a, an atomic function that uh, looks at the uh, how many records we have stored so far uh, value, atomically increments it, and returns the, the old value that basically reserves a slot in, in the, the buffer. And then we, we fill that buffer. Um, there is actually a base condition in this, in that um, theoretically if something was being logged at the same time as you were reading the values out from there, uh, you might, the, the code reading the values out would say, oh, you have 101 records stored, uh, whereas in fact 100, 100 records have been stored and the 101 is in the process of being written. Um, in fact, it's not an issue here for two reasons. First, because we only care about what's happening during the, the kernel boot process. And so by the time we get into user land and, and read this syslog to get the output, we don't care what's happening there. Um, and second, the time it takes to go through the entire buffer and read everything out is way longer than the time it takes to fill in that last record. So it's a theoretical base condition, but not one we care about. Uh, when the buffer is full, we just throw away any new records that come in, because again, we want the beginning of the system running and not anything that happen later on. If your system, you, know, you have hundreds of CPUs or something, and, and it, you, know, you find it, you're running past the, the limit on the number of records, you just build a new kernel with a, 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 an option set to increase the number of records to keep in the buffer. Um, the, this buffer, by the way, it's uh, actually defined at compile time, so you, you get a kernel which, which knows it has a certain number of records. Um, it, it sets aside in the kernel uh, BSS. Um, so it, it really does need to be recompiled um, thing is, this starts running before we have virtual memory, so you can't just say, oh, we'll, we'll just find some memory and use it. It needs to be at the, in the kernel. Um, each record has a, a cycle count, which is just the, the CPU cycle count. Um, 
value, uh, and this is something that now pretty much OECP implements in some form. Um, a thread ID, uh, a record type, and then one or two strings. I'll, I'll explain later on why the, the thread ID matters. Um, there's a bunch of macros that are used for locking things to this. Um, all of these macros, uh, if you compile a kernel that does not have the, the TS log option set, uh, the macros just compile to nothing. So great thing about macros, you can have them defined in different ways depending on, on uh, what macros you have defined. Um, so this means that the, all the code I added to the tree for, for implementing this, um, anybody that does not want to timestamp their kernel to profile their, their, their kernel boot, uh, they are with exactly the same kernels they had before, uh, except some lines have moved around, so some, some debug information will be different. Um, and then when you want to get, after you finish booting the system, you want to get the data out to analyze it, um, the, the debug TS log syscall does that. So most of what we want to know is going to be when did we enter a function and when did we leave it, because you subtract those two values that tells you how much time you spend in that function. Uh, so the TS enter macro records that we just entered a function. So it, it records the current function name, which fortunately in C is available as a macro, um, and then the current thread, the timestamp, etc., etc. Um, similarly, TS exit is used to record that we're leaving the function. Um, so you can just go, go through the tree and insert these wherever you want, wherever you think is, is useful, um, and then reboot your kernel. Compile your kernel, reboot it, and get some data out at the end. Um, of course, you need to have some idea of where you want to put these. Um, but uh, I started with the, the top of the boot process, so hammer time with the, the AMD64 machine-dependent startup function. Uh, MI startup, which is the, the machine independent startup, which happens on, on every system, uh, and then start in it. Um, then there's some functions that you care about because they get called a lot. Delay, if, if some driver is calling delay a lot, uh, we want to know, we want to figure out why. Um, and it, we'll see later on, a lot of the time spent during the kernel boot is in fact spent with this driver saying, let's sit around and do nothing for a while. Um, vprintf is a, a function inside the, the kernel uh, logging code. Um, there's a number of different ways to print things from the console output, but they all end up going through vprintf, so that's why I decided to implement that particular function, but it, I could have implemented log or printf, a number of different, different functions in there instead. Um, and then there's, there's three types of, of uh, functions that we Three, three types of functions that I decided to instrument, uh, which I, I decided were useful to instrument. Uh, there's all the sysinit routines. Um, there's the device probing and attaching routines, and then uh, the functions used for mounting file systems. So I'll just uh, explain these in a moment, but uh, just so you can see what it looks like to annotate a function. Um, the macros look like function calls, but um, you can see we, we use capitalized uh, names for these, so TS enter at the top, and then uh, TS exit at the bottom, saying we're about to, to exit the function. And then also in the middle you see there another TS exit um, before the, the return. Um, because these are acting like function calls, it, it, if you turn it on, it, it compiles to a function call. Um, you have to tell the compiler, I want to call this function at this point. Um, there's no way of, of having the compiler automatically insert, enter, and, and exit calls when it enters and exits the function. I spent some time trying to figure out if I could trick Clang into inserting these as function prolog and epilog code. Uh, I, I don't recommend trying to read the function prolog and epilog code in Clang. Uh, in, in C++, I have seen people use very uh, interesting tricks to have code automatically run when they, they exit functions by making the code a, a destructor for an object and that sort of gets called when the object goes out of scope. Uh, but we use C in the kernel, uh, so 
if, if your function happens to be exiting in, in several, returning in several different ways, you, you need to init TS exit in several different places. But most functions in the kernel, uh, they only exit, they only return from one place. Um, so it, it's not too much of a, a burden to, to instrument it in several places if needed. So sysinits I mentioned, um, these are routine that uh, mechanism that previously uses to specify that code needs to be run during the kernel boot process. So that's exactly what it looks like when you when you put it into, into your code. Uh, you say sysinit, you give it a name. Um, there's two order parameters. One is sort of a, a, a high level ordering, and then the second is used to play ties within each step of the boot process. And then there's a function, and then there's a parameter that gets passed to the function. Um, if anybody in this room has done Linux kernel de development, I, I hope not, but if you, if you have suffered that way, um, these are, are very similar to Linux init calls. Um, the way that they work, um, a record goes into a, a special ELF section in the, the kernel binary, and then there's some linker magic that collects them all together and, and makes it possible for the kernel to just iterate through all of them. And so that's what MISRHUB does. It, it gets a list of all the, the system and functions uh, it looks at the order parameters, sorts them all, um, and then it, it just goes to calling them one by one until it gets to the end of the list. Um, this uh, sysinit, what looks like function, it, it's, it's a macro. Um, so if we have the, the TS log kernel option in, in the, the kernel configuration, uh, we just redefine the sysinit macro to uh, call a shim function instead. I didn't want to be going through every single place that we we have a, a function called from a, a sysinit, so instead, um, rather than having my startup call the function that you asked for, I have a call a shim, which then calls the function you asked for. So uh, this is what the, the code that's that's declaring um, sysinit does, uh, the begin, beginning of it. So uh, you can see at the top, I, I, I have a structure which is basically saying, what, what's the function that, that, that was supposed to be called that the, the, the coder asked for um, from the sysinit and what's the data being passed to it, and then also what's the name of the, the sysinit. And uh, there's this, this shim function which literally all it does is it, it calls, it records that we are entering a sysinit, then it calls the sysinit function and it records that we've exited from that. Device probe and device attach. Um, these are all called under the configure2 sysinit. Um, there is a configure1, which doesn't do very much. Um, I don't know the exact history of, of uh, the, the device probing code, but yeah, it's, it's configure2, um, which, which recurses through all the hash classes on the system and looks for devices. So it says, oh, we're, we're running a x86 system. OK, let's see if there's HPI out there. Okay. We found an ACPI, does it have any buses attached to it? Oh, it has a PCI bus, okay, let's look. If, if, is there anything attached to this PCI bus? Oh, there's a PCI bridge attached to it. Is there anything attached to PCI bridge? Oh, there's another PCI bus, etc. Um, so it, it goes through, and, and at each level of, of, of probe, each bus that it's looking at, um, there's a, it will call all of the driver device probe routines and say, basically, do you recognize this thing we just found? Do you know what to do with it? Uh, and device probe routines have the option of saying, well, I sort of recognize it, or saying, yes, I know exactly what to do with it. Uh, and so the, the code will, will take whichever driver is, is the most confident about, about knowing what to do with a, a piece of hardware, uh, and then call the, that particular driver's device attached routine on it. Um, all of the, these uh, device probe, device attach, and other things that detach, Sleep, uh, sleep resume um, methods. Uh, they're all declared by the, the dev method macro. And uh, yes, the word method is appropriate here because the kernel is object oriented. Um, if, if you want to see uh, very interesting uh, <laughs> code, uh, feel free to, to look into the, the K obj man page. Um, if you've seen uh, .m files in the tree, uh, these are files that define interfaces for object-oriented parts of the tree. Um, the, in the case of, of devices, um, all the, the device something 
um, they look like macros that are actually functions, uh, which are defined as inline functions in device if.h, which is generated from device if.m. If uh, and these are all fairly standard object method dispatch code. So if you've, I don't know, in maybe second or third year university, you, you, you've taken a course on object-oriented programming and you've, you've, heard about the, you've read about the implementation of these, basically it's code that, that looks up for, for a particular structure, figures out inside it, where's the, the function pointer that, that says how to, how to call a particular method. So it, it finds that and then it, it calls the method you asked for. Uh, make object ops awk uh, is the the awk script that takes the .m files and produces the .h and .c files. Um, so I just I made a few changes to that to uh, teach it to have prologs and epilogues for the method dispatch code, uh, and then I, I annotated device if.m to tell it for the the device probe and device attached methods, um, we want to call TS enter and TS exit before and after we, we call the, the methods that were being requested. DFS mount, um, this is just a straightforward macro. Great um, macros are easy to modify. Um, so all I did here is add two lines. Um, here it, it's TS raw rather than TS enter and TS exit. That's just because I, I wanted to um, pass in the, the name of the file system type being uh, mounted rather than, uh, if, if I just used TS enter and TS exit, they would just pass in the, the name of the function that's calling the macro. So between all these, um, it tells us for each thread um, what, what function is it in at a particular time, that is, what function out of the functions that we've annotated. Um, but that's not exactly what we need once we get into later parts of the kernel boot, because sometimes we have multiple steps running. Uh, in particular, uh, there are points in the boot process where the sort of main thread of execution will stop and wait for other threads to do things. Um, the first one of these is the uh, interconfig hooks this in it. Um, this is because the device probing happens quite early in the boot process before you have interrupts enabled. But sometimes, in order to turn on a device, you need to have interrupts. You need to be able to send in a message and, and wait for an interrupt to happen to tell you that it's, it's set to reply. So this is a way that drivers can uh, say, OK, I, I've done some initialization of this device, but I need to come back later once we have interrupts and finish initializing it. So they call this, this uh, interrupt hook establish function to say, wait for us to finish doing our bit before you go on and, and finish the boot process. Um, gwait idle um, is a function that, that waits for the geom event queue to be empty. Uh, the geom event queue, um, when a, a new disk arrives, uh, it goes onto the event queue uh, with an event saying, hey, look at this, figure out what it is. Um, and then each time that, that we look at what it is and we find, say, oh, it's a mirror, um, then a new event goes onto the queue saying, oh, so there's, there's a new geom, which is the mirror device. Or if it's encrypted, a new uh, event will go onto the queue saying, uh, this is the, the encrypted disk. Uh, until we've finally explored all of the, the layers upon layers in, in the geom system. Again, this is a case of we don't want to go on and, and finish the boot process until we've explored the, the disk out there, because you might be trying to boot from your encrypted, mirrored, um, off-site disk, and if it's not there yet, the boot process is going to fail. Um, finally, uh, VFS mount boot wait is just a, a general uh, mechanism which different parts of the tree can use to say, hey, don't mount boot until we tell you that we're ready for you to do that. Um, the only place this is used significantly is by the USB driver. Uh, if you've ever had your system say uh, root mount waiting for US bus zero, uh, that's what's happening. It's, it's saying, well, we think it, it's just possible that you're trying to boot off of the USB disk. So we're going to wait until we finish exploring all of the USB buses, um, just in case there's that disk somewhere uh, before we allow the system to keep on booting. So it's possible we could have 
I could have gotten the information I needed about one thread waiting for others uh, out of the kernel scheduler. You know, I could log you know, which thread is running at any particular time. I would need to log um, wake up calls. I would need to log, log uh, locks being acquired. I decided that was way too much work, so I went with a, a much simpler option. Um, any time that, that part of the main thread of the boot process is waiting for something, I just added records, in, uh, logged records at that point saying, we're about to start waiting for something, and oh, we finished waiting for it. Uh, and then in the, the functions which uh, do things like saying, uh, don't, don't boot the system until we've, we've finished doing our stuff, um, I logged when they were acquiring that, that hold on the boot process and when they released it. Um, this is why I was logging the, the names of threads, uh, because later on when we, when we want to look at the output, um, it's important for us to say, okay, we were waiting for a thread and, oh, that thread was called something. Um, if all we had was, was the, the pointer to the thread or, or nothing at all, um, it would, it would tell us we were, we were waiting for something, but we don't know what it was. Um, there's a couple of heuristics I used in here for uh, analyzing the data I got out of it. Um, there may be times when there are several different uh, parts of the kernel that are, all, that are all blocking the boot process at the same time. Um, I went with the, the simple heuristic that whichever one released their lock the last, is one that I blame for the time that they, that they spent holding that lock. Um, you know, if, if, if other parts of the boot manage to, to grab a lock and then release it quickly, it, they're not slowing things down. It, it's, it's the one that we're waiting for at the end that, that sort of matters the most. Um, and then also another heuristic, um, once, I've, once I've decided I'm, I'm blaming this thread for, for holding up the boot process ending at this point, um, I need to figure out how long do I blame it for. Uh, and I decided, well, the, the later of when that thread picked up a boot hold, uh, the, the, the particular boot hold it released, um, or when that thread was created. Um, this, this sounds a bit more complicated than it needs to be, but uh, you have to realize there are many times in the kernel where one thread will pick up that hold and say, don't proceed until this is released, and then a different thread is actually doing the work in releasing it. So. It's not a perfect heuristic, but it, it works well enough for my purposes. So after we've booted the system and we, we've got all this data lodged in the kernel, um, we dump all of it out through the sysital. Um, then we just sort it by, by the thread ID that we have in those records. Um, and we, we can organize it into threads, and then for each thread, use the, the entry exit records to construct timestamp stacks. Now, these aren't really stacks in the sense that we're familiar with, um, because it, it, it doesn't say every function that we've, we've gone through. Uh, it only tells us the log <laughs> functions. So it, it's, it's not perfect, uh, but if, if there's a function we're interested in, it tells us about that function. Um, the kernel boot process, um, I'm sort of arbitrarily saying, is Thread zero, which is where we, we start running the system. Uh, later on, that turns into the, the swapper uh, process. Uh, plus the, the thread that later becomes in it, uh, but ending at the point that it enters user land. This is, between those two, it, it covers the duration of, of the boot process. Um, the, the init, the thread that becomes the init process, is actually created halfway through um, the, the MI startup function, but it's, it's blocked because it needs to pick up the giant block, and giant is not released by MI startup until it's about to, to become a swapper. So between those two, it, it covers the, the time period we care about. Um, and then every time that one of those two threads we have logged, it is uh, waiting for something to happen. Um, I look at, so what's it waiting for? Which thread? Was, was releasing that lock at the end, uh, and then I take the, the stacks I have for that thread and just place them on top of the stacks I have from, from these two threads. Um, so that, that gives us a set of stacks, or, or pseudo stacks, that cover the entire duration of, of the kernel boot process. 
so what do we do when we have a bunch of facts? Well, normally we turn to flame graphs. Um, of course, anybody who's used E-Trace will, will have used flame graphs for those. Um, turns out flame graphs aren't perfect for this. They're great for visualizing what's going on in a running system, but uh, we're, we're not talking about a, a long running system here. We're, we're talking about the very beginning of the system. And so what we care about, to a large extent, is chronological order, what happens in what order. Um, flame graphs, they sort everything in, in alphabetical order. Uh, it's great for aggregating together if, if you're, you, know, you, you have a, a, C, a CPU, which is bouncing between doing several different things, uh, you know, a thousand times a second, and you lock it for a few seconds. You want to sort those so that you know, you know this much time is spent in aggregate calling one function, and this time is spent in aggregate calling another function. Um, but for our purpose, we want to keep things in chronological order. So flame charts is apparently the name used for something that looks like flame graphs, but it, it keeps its data sorted in chronological order. So this is the sort of thing you end up with. Um, those of you who, are, who have worked with flame graphs will be familiar with the color scheme of, of uh, reds and oranges and yellows. Uh, at the top, you can see blue and green as well. Um, this is something I, I hacked into the, the flame chart code um, that I used for this. Um, everything that's blue is the delay function. So uh, particularly on the, the Amazon EC2 instance, you can see there's a lot of time being spent just delaying uh, during the boot process. And then everything in green is uh, vprintf. So, uh, Especially in the middle here, um, where we're, this is a device attached ACPI. So a whole chunk in the middle of, of attaching a, the ACPI device uh, on these two instances is just being spent printing stuff to the console. So looking at, at, at these graphs, you can immediately see the sort of blow up. If, you can, if, you, if your eyesight is good enough to read the text on it, but uh, if it's on your laptop, you can read it. Um, you can immediately see uh, where it is the time is going during the boot process. So, some interesting things I caught out here. Um, hammer time. Um, about 640 milliseconds is being spent in hammer time before we even enter the machine independent startup process. Um, I was surprised by this because I thought the, the machine independent startup process was supposed to be really, really fast. Just Set a few options, and then immediately we go into machine independent startup. Um, it turns out this 640 milliseconds is because on AMD64, we want to make sure that the keyboard is working. We want to make sure it works really, really early. Even if we don't have a console we can print output to, we want to make sure that the keyboard is working so that if the kernel panics really early in the boot process, I guess you can type things blindly and make something work. <laughs> I don't know, but it's doing that. Um, there's the, the time spent initializing the, the virtual memory I mentioned earlier. Um, time spent calibrating the, the CPU clock frequency. Uh, start APS, this is uh, starting the, the auxiliary processors, so everything apart from, from CPU zero. Uh, takes three milliseconds on my laptop, which has four cores. Um, takes uh, 800 milliseconds on the East 2 instance, which has 16 uh, virtual CPUs. Um, I haven't dug into this in great detail, but I, I think what's happening there is that uh, there's lock contention uh, as a result of time being spent printing stuff to the, the console output. Um, the, the way that, that this function, that the starting of, of auxiliary CPUs works, um, only one can start doing stuff, start itself up at, at, at a time, um, and each of them decides to print something to the console log before it releases its log and lets the next one start up. So that 800 milliseconds might be very easy to fix. Um, device probe HTT star, there's, there's, there are actually two devices in there uh, which were collectively taking 320 milliseconds. Um, device probe functions, uh, most of them take significantly less than one millisecond. Um, many of them are on the order of 200 clock cycles. Um, it turns out that uh, the device probe routines for these two drivers were looking at every device on the system and also, in fact, looking at every location where this particular hardware could be, theoretically. 
Um, I sent an email to the uh, author of these drivers, and after about a week, uh, they came back with a patch, um, which just moves that to the device attach routine. They didn't need to do this while they were probing. <laughs> they only did it on, on attach. Um, so that's now uh, gone. Um, Yes, and that, that's the, the mouse driver. Um, I really knew it took 2,000 milliseconds on my laptop. Uh, what I didn't realize was it, it takes one and a half seconds on EC2. Now, EC2 instances don't have mice attached. But it was still taking one and a half seconds looking for mice <laughs> attached to the EC2 instances. Um, the the uh, clock system, that's, that's uh, elevating the, the local APIC timer. Um, G event, um, this is only on my laptop, um, it was doing jelly key elevate derivation. Um, on ECU, I wasn't using jelly, of course. Um, waiting for US plus zero, I mentioned earlier. Um, the, the, uh, the profiling determined that my laptop was spending nine seconds with waiting for that. Well, I'd like to get rid of that time. Uh, there's actually a, an option for telling it, don't wait for USB devices. Uh, it would be really nice if we could have a way of automatically figuring out oh, we're, we're running a ZFS system and we have all the disks we want for ZFS. How about we just go ahead and boot? Uh, there's actually code in the FreeBSD kernel that if we're booting off of UFS, uh, it will recognize when we have the disk we need. But it doesn't know how to do that for ZFS. So I see Alan looking thoughtful, maybe he'll fix that for me. Um, and then uh, vprintf, uh, 720 milliseconds on my laptop, about four seconds in EC2. So, we, we need to speed up how we print stuff to the console output. Um, I, I think I tracked, well, on my laptop I tracked this, this down to uh, the VT driver. Uh, I suspect it's the same issue in uh, EC2. Um, every time the, the screen scrolls, we were redrawing all the text for the entire screen. With not a high resolution display, it takes a while. So, some of these I knew about already. Um, the ones in red, uh, I did not know about. I discovered in the process of going through uh, doing the profiling and looking at the flame charts I got at the, the end. So this sort of answers the question I started with. Why profile the FreeBSD kernel boot? Well, if you take a systematic approach to it, um, it'll, it will tell you a lot more than if you just look at it and, and watch the system boot and say, gee, it looks like it's taking a while at this point. Um, and collectively, uh, uh, that's uh, about five, uh, six or seven seconds being spent. So I, I didn't realize it was being spent in different parts of the kernel boot. Um, it, it's useful to actually profile things properly rather than just looking at it. So all the code for this, um, the, the TS log code, it's in the FreeBSD tree uh, in head. I haven't merged it back to Sable, but I'll, I'll do that at some point. Um, so anybody out there, um, Particularly if you have unusual <coughs> hardware, if you're running something which is not AMD64, uh, please enable TS, add options TS log to your kernel, build a new kernel, and produce a flame chart. Uh, let, let, let's find out where it's spending the time. Um, the visualization code is up on GitHub. Um, so what, once, once you have your, your kernel, you've, you've rebooted it into that kernel. Um, you just download the code from here, and there's a readme that tells you the, the script you need to run to get the data out of the, the kernel and um, process it, and then another one that, that produces the, the flame charts. So I'm just about out of time, but uh, any questions? Yes? Yes, so I was in building my kernel and rebooting on and stuff, okay. and I got a bunch of paper says, I'm saying I'm going backwards. Is that anything you uh, Okay, yeah, so uh, the question is, um, Sometimes the, the script uh, outputs that the timestamp went backwards. Um, I should probably make it less verbose about those things. Um, I, in all the cases that I've seen that, the timestamp has been going back by less than 100 clock cycles. Um, I don't know if this is a case of clock skew between different CPUs, uh, or if it's a case of uh, just the base condition. If two CPUs are trying to log something at the same time, uh, whichever CPU the cache line happens to be in will will grab the, the value first. Um, yes, I, I, I should change that to only print a warning if it goes back by a significant amount. Um, this did actually find a bug on, on I think it was an ARM system 
where the, the, the uh, CPU cycle count was getting reset in the middle of the boot process. So it, it, it is a useful warning, but, but not in the particular case that, that you took over here. Other questions? Yes. So were you able to get any quick wins in the CPU process? Um, so I, I so far I have identified a whole bunch of problems and there have been a couple things like so the the, the VM boot time uh, the initializing the VM arrays um, it turned out that the the VM mem system was iterating through all of the pages three times it said, it, initializing different parts of the structures each time um, so. I sent a couple emails and then a patch arrived in the tree a few days later, uh, which changed that to iterate through the page at once and fill in everything at, at the same time. So that part is now three times faster. Uh, the, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, the, the HPT drivers I mentioned got fixed, so that's the 20 mil something and so on. Um, I, I know how to fix the, the clock calibration to make it much faster, but I haven't got that in the tree yet. Um, <laughs> The, the PSM, the, the mouse initialization, and, and also keyboard initialization. Um, I know why it's taking a long time. It's because back on the original PC hardware, uh, you had to wait 200 milliseconds after, uh, after resetting the keyboard controller for voltages to reach the right level. We don't actually run on original PC hardware anymore. I don't think we need to wait 200 milliseconds for the voltage to stabilize. Uh, but I, I haven't fixed that yet. So it, it, it's a, a few things have been fixed. There's a lot of things where I know what's going on, but I haven't fixed it yet. I, I'm, I'm hoping that in Ottawa, in about three months, uh, I'll be able to say at the Dev Summit, look at how much faster it, it all runs, but I, I haven't finished doing that yet. So the second question is, this whole exercise was yak-shaving on the path of getting your video driver. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, yes, the, the video does work on my new laptop. Um, I, I'm not using my, my new laptop for this presentation because it does not have a VGA output, uh, but yes, it does work, and I can even suspend and resume, uh, and it, it works perfectly. And you can do those fixes as well? Uh, well, uh, but most of those fixes were, were done by people working on the, the DRM Next branch, so I, 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 I was mainly find, finding issues which they then fixed. But. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't cope with that. Um, I, mean, I guess we could add extra logging to record when the CPU frequency changes. Uh, I suspect that your CPU frequency isn't going to be changing in the middle of a kernel boot. It, um, it, it switches on the start very early on. Okay. Um, then, then I guess the, that could be added. I mean, to a certain extent, it, we're, we're logging CPU cycle counts, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's absolutely useful to, to know how many seconds it took rather than how many cycles it took for a particular part of the process. But yes, we, we could um, log uh, changes in CPU frequency. Uh, in fact, the, the flame charts I get out of this, they, they don't convert anything to seconds. It, they, they all only report it in terms of up. So, to a certain extent, I've dodged that bullet. But yes, we, we could uh, account for for change in cycle uh, part frequency and I could throw everything to the second program. Alan? Did you try it on machines with a large number of disks, like 60 hardware? I have not tried it on systems with lots of disks. Uh, I understand that you have systems with lots of disks, <laughs> so uh, please, please try that. <laughs> Would that matter if you have 60 hard drives mm -hmm. if you are likely running a server? And the server is not that important. Okay. It can be. Okay. I want the server to come back up on this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think we, we don't want to be rebooting servers all that often, but if the server panics, we want to bring it back up. <laughs> yes. uh, how much work do you think it requires to make this code working in some other architectures, like ARM or PowerPC? Uh, right, okay. so the question is about other architectures. Um, it should be very easy. Um, so all the machine independent stuff is already instrumented. Um, I, I, it was two lines of code I had to hammer time to instrument that. I, I considered doing it for the other machine uh, dependent startup routines. Uh, the only reason I didn't is I, I couldn't test it. And um, I, I needed to be a bit uh, clever in how I did it in hammer time because the TS enter makes use of curve thread which doesn't exist at the beginning of that. So I had to uh, be a bit careful about that. 
uh, I didn't want to do something clever for a different architecture, which I couldn't test, and then I ended up making it off boot. So, but if, yeah, if you have something other than AMD64, um, feel free to talk to me. I can show you exactly what you need to, to add to the code. Um, just please make sure you test it before you do it. Any other questions? Oh, yes, what right back. Uh, did you try doing uh, this with uh, kernel modules? Did I try doing this with kernel modules? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I think the kernel options get passed through to the building of kernel modules, so I think it will just work. Uh, now, if you have a kernel module which is compiled with this option, then you can build, try to link it into a kernel that doesn't have the option. I think it will just refuse to load it because the linker will say it's trying to link to a function that doesn't exist. So I I don't think there's any issues there. I, I think it will just work as you would hope it would with kernel modules. Um, and did you try um, running the perfing in line while the system is booting or printing other stuff to print this uh, like cold tree? So you can have a call tree basically while the, I'm interested because uh, while debugging kernel modules, it's quite a pain to see the call tree when uh, running a certain module. Right, okay, so, so the, the question I, if I understand is, is uh, did I try printing out a call tree or, or anything while the system is booting up? Yeah. Um, and, and the answer is no, I, I specifically avoided that. Um, I mentioned uh, a lot of time is being spent in uh, vprintf, printing things to the console, uh, and so I was once I noticed that I was really careful to make sure I did not print anything extra to the console because I knew if I did print more things to the console, it would slow things down, and then I would be measuring the impact of printing stuff to the console along the impact of the, the original target boot process. So. Uh, but this is you know, one of the advantages of, of locking everything in the kernel and then dumping it later rather than having things go through, through the, the console. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, the CLang uh, code for entering and leaving functions is quite ugly. Uh, did you try inserting an LLVM uh, pass into it? So, uh, because as far as I know, it has uh, some kind of interface that lets you identify when a function leaves or enters. Um, so the, the question is, is about uh, LLVM and, yeah. and uh, automatically having things happen when we enter and exit functions. Uh, it, it may be that there's a better way of doing it than what I was looking at. But I, I was looking at Clang code, and uh, there was some machine-dependent Clang code outputting weird stuff of LLVM bytecode and. Uh, it, it was it was beyond my level of competency with compilers, so uh, just too much yak to shave. Right, there, there, there's too, too, too much yak to shave for, for this presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, do you think it would be good uh, if we could use uh, some different counters for the time measurement? A lot of architectures are providing something like high precision timers, and by avoiding using cycle counts, we could uh, avoid the problem with the CPU frequency change. Do you think it's applicable here? <laughs> uh, so the, the, the question is um, about using things other than cycle counters on uh, other architectures. Um, it's possible, but I would be wary about that uh, for two reasons. First, um, things other than cycle counters tend to take longer to access. Um, so it's, it's possible that that would affect the value of the measuring. Um, and uh, the other issue is I don't know if they're accessible at the very beginning of the boot process. Um, it, it, would, it would depend on the, the sort of hardware it is, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, you know, on AMD64, you can't access things like the, the APEC timers because like, you don't know what, what APEX are at, at the, 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 the beginning of the boot process. So um, it, it's possible, but I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. The, something that's built into the CPU, you know it's going to be there because you're running on a CPU. more questions? No, I don't see any more. Okay, thank you.